afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. John Belkowitz, and I have the privilege, nay, the pleasure, of diving back into the magical world of concrete with you today. We're going to be getting into module number three, Concrete Additives 103, still a 100 level class. So we're skimming the surface. We'll be diving into more detail as we get into the mix design. Saw a little bit of that in uh, pavement number 16 or PMXDB number 16 for the pavement design. But we're actually going back to it, going to do a revisit. We're going to look at these admixtures that we're going to be using, specifically those special high performance ones. So overview, dive into the purpose of this presentation. Then we're going to look at our class objectives, part one and two. What are and how, uh, what are additives, how do they work? And then of course part two is how do we use them? We'll wrap it up with a concise summary. Open up the floor for any questions. All right, let's get to this purpose. So the additives that we are specifically doing, using are doing three things. First, creating the fresh and hardened properties that are required by the engineer. Our air content, our compressive strength, uh, our key. The next thing is, is getting us a creamy and dreamy mix that the finishers are going to like, the contractors use to get that great concrete down the chute into the formwork Friday, 4.30 in the afternoon. Creamy and dreamy, gets finished, gets closed up, get broomed or tined, and then we're off our job site with no problems. No fuss, no fuss, no coconuts. The third thing is making our concrete stronger and last longer, and ultimately that's our primary overarching objective is to save the world with all the concrete in it so the United States Air Force can fight and win wars. What are they and how do they work? Uh, the first type is these powdered additives. We call them supplementary cementitious materials and even secondary cementitious materials. They fit uh, under a few different ASTMs. We've got ASTM C618 for our Class C, Class F, and Class N fly ash. Then we have ASTM C989 for our slag, which is much more of a hydraulic material compared to our class F, which is pozzolanic, and our class C is hydraulic. And then we have our ASTM C1240, our silica fume, which is this pozzolanic material. When I say pozzolanic, it doesn't have that hydraulic component, that calcium hydroxide or calcium oxide that kicks off those thermokinetics of cement hydration. And then after that, we've got some metacaolin, which we really won't be focusing on during the research. But more importantly, we've got this nanosilica, which is really the underlying thing that we're going to look at so that we can save the world with all the concrete in it. And the great thing about these materials is that they are durability champions. And if you've heard me say it once, if not a few times, we're trying to make our concrete stronger and last longer. And the advantages of these matured pozzolans, these matured supplementary cementitious materials is that they were durability champions. They were inexpensive. They can induce a secondary reaction that reduced the permeability, increased the density of the concrete, and they were readily available. The disadvantages are that nowadays they're not as available. They have a variability in quality, can be expensive, but ultimately they're not reliable to give us consistent fresh and hardened properties and a durability factor that gives us confidence in saying that this will last 10, 20, 30 years, especially when we're landing multiple aircraft, heavy aircraft, that have to fight and win wars, meet our mission objectives. I'm wondering if I can say fight and win wars one more time during this presentation. Um, so what these cementitious and pozzolanic materials do, and it's important for you to understand it, it combines with water, the parent materials of cement tricalcium, dicalcium silicate, they combine with water, they dissolve, they reorganize to get a calcium silica ratio anywhere between 0.7 and 3.2, where they start gelling and hardening into these um, amorphous-like crystals, these, these polymers, hardened gels that make up the backbone of concrete strength. Now, from those reactions, we get a byproduct, this cancer of concrete calcium hydroxide, lime portlandite, it neither bonds to itself nor anything else and in the presence of water will dissolve back into solution to allow more aggressive materials to migrate through that percolation or that poor connectivity that's left by the dissolved calcium hydroxide. What we want to do is take some of that silica, that pozzolanic material, combine it with the calcium hydroxide to create more of that backbone of concrete strength, that calcium silicate hydrate. Now, 
We used to be able to do that with that class F fly ash and silica fume that was available to our industry, but nowadays, with these lower volumes, especially with our renewable energy movements, we need another solution. We need another answer for these durability problems. Now, as I said, this, this silica, this pozzolanic reaction, consumes that cancer of concrete at the expense of that we get this calcium silicate hydrate, that backbone of concrete strength, and what it gives us is more of this particle to particle packing, this void filling, this percolation or porosity reduction, ultimately creating an environment that is less conducive to physical and chemical attack. And what you see in front of you is that matured class of flash that we used to use when I had a full head of hair when I first got in the industry, as it combines with calcium hydroxide, that cancer of concrete. Now, other types of admixtures out there are in the great state of Colorado, we need air and training agents to deal with that freezing and thawing of water. Normally, we have entrapped air. Using an air and training agent, we take this big air bubble and we change it into an interconnected network of smaller air bubbles so that when water freezes and it expands, that is a place to go. Very important for us here in Colorado to keep that concrete along for a lot longer so we can meet the mission objectives to... Fight and win wars! At least I didn't say it. Um, outside of that, we're also going to be looking at these ASTMC 494 chemical admixtures for concrete. Most of them are either an accelerator, retarder, or some type of water reducer. And then, of course, our Type S, which our colloidal silica or nano silica technology falls into. Now, for water reducing admixtures, back in the day, we had to use a lot more water in our concrete to get uh, the flowability, the workability that we wanted for that great concrete coming down the chute. We started designing these technologies, these chemicals that change the electronegative potential of that water cement combination, the pH of it, so that it would deflocculate the cement that traps the water. And that's the biggest issue that we add some water to cement, we have these negative and positive ions, these charged particles, and basically the cement traps up the water. If we can change up that electronegative potential, which was one of the original technologies for water reduction, we can break up those flocculates and we don't have to use as much water to get the same highly fluid mix. Now those earlier technologies, the naphthalenes, the lignans, the melamines were great, but I believe it was in the uh, early 1990s we came up with these polycarboxylate cone polymers that instead of having an impact on the pH for deflocculation, they operated off of a mechanical approach called steric repulsion, which basically meant the polycarboxylate comb polymers that actually looks like combs, they would adsorb onto a cement particle surface, and then the teeth on the adjacent side would repel other teeth that were on other polycarboxylates that had adsorbed onto other cement particles. So it was more of a mechanical interaction that caused that deflocculation, but still, we got a major reduction in water while still maintaining that workability and that, that slump, that spread. And what that gives us is that concrete that is more dense, that is stronger, and of course, lasts longer. Um, so why do we need these admixtures? You know, I've got some really pretty pictures here. Most of them have to do with something that we see here in the great state of Colorado. Uh, and it, it happens to be that we have some very reactive aggregate. And, we're not racing to open up any new quarries or dredge any new rivers, so we have to work with the aggregate that we do have, and that aggregate is reactive to alkalize in the cement, and it creates this white paste that expands from within the concrete, cracks, and then it leaches out. And, I mean, it's, it's a, a vicious cycle that we can't get past because it happens at the interfacial zone between the aggregate and the cement body, the hydrated cement matrix. And it's the very components that cause those thermokinetics of cement hydration that create this expansive gel that basically increases in pressure or increases in size, thus creating this residual pressure at that residual uh, or at that, that interfacial zone, eventually causing some residual stresses that overcome the shear and tensile capacity of not only the hydrated cement matrix, but also the aggregate ultimately causing not only the concrete to fracture but the rock to fracture and this this by the way is a picture of that that nasty nasty alkali silica reactive gel and this is called an alkali silica gel rosette and despite the fact that it's 
it really just beats up concrete and, and, and lays the seeds for more nasty mechanisms like steel corrosion to tear it apart. And when you look at it under a microscope, this ASR gel rosette is, is quite beautiful to me. Um, and what we did, what my Whitney and I did through my research during my PhD and what we took advantage of during this uh, AFWORKS program is, you know, the ability for those nanoparticles to influence, to manipulate the molecular kinetics of cement hydration so that it has a chance to overcome that physical and chemical attack that we get from that alkali silica reactivity. You know, we have this bridge in Quebec uh, that had to be torn out and these some great pictures of that bridge right before it was torn out. And you can see the delineation between where the concrete was protected by soil and where it just constantly got wetted and saturated and how that excess water just caused that concrete to break from within. And you can see this ASR gel mapping just totally tear it apart. These are not just surface cracks, but these are cracks that cause this bridge to prematurely fail. And then you have things like this that just look like horror movies. This is a dam that we currently use here in the United States on the West Coast. And no, this is not a horror movie. This is a combination of ASR gel attack and steel corrosion. And this wasn't taken before the concrete was demolished. This was taken on an, uh, from an uh, in-service structure. So this is a structure that is currently being used through or in the United States and it is going through a failure mechanism. Just like when you see trees in the summer with leaves that are brown and pine needles that are brown and the branches break off easily, the tree might not be dead, but the tree is dying. This dam might not be dead, but the dam is dying. Um, and this is not a surprise. We've been needing these new technologies uh, for uh, a little over a decade. This is a paper published by the team at the Bureau of Reclamation at the Denver, Denver Federal Center and they list out three reasons why these things like ASR have been getting worse and they list it out right in front. So we knew about this back in 2009 and the three reasons are these higher alkali, the first one is these higher alkali cements, these cements that cause that alkali silica reactivity to kick off as well as the thermal kinetics of cement hydration. And back in the late 90s or before the late 90s, we had these slower reacting cements that had lower alkali contents. We called them Hoover Dam cements. But in the late 90s, we had a huge cement shortage here. We had to go to India and China to get cements. And those cements were finer. They had more alkalis. And in 24 hours, we got 28 day strengths and contractors loved them. And eventually, when we went back to US based cements, they took on the characteristics of these cements that we got during the great cement shortage. Another thing that's looked up is that or are found that we don't have the volumes of quality aggregate, non-reactive aggregate that we used to have. And it's not like aggregate is changing. I'm not asking you how old you believe the earth is. It's just that we used to have some amazing aggregate and we have amazing geologists. And unfortunately we've used most, if not all of it up. And here in Colorado, we have very short supplies of good sand and good rock. The last reason is ineffective pozzolans. You know, we've got this article coming out uh, that looks at this this change in renewable energy, a uh, change of where we've gotten our energy from. At one point it was coal combustion. Of course we had a surplus of coal combustion residue because of that. But since 1978, we've been turning the tide on where we get our electrical energy. I mean, shoot, you look on my horizon over here and it's nothing but wind turbines. We've got natural gas. We just don't use that much coal anymore. And because of that, we don't have as much coal combustion residue. So there are states like Indiana, uh, Texas, uh, I believe Arizona, New Mexico, that either are not getting the fly ashes, fly ash volumes that they used to to mitigate these things, or they're not getting any fly ash whatsoever. The last time I was at the Transportation Review Board in DC, it was either 13 or 16 states, I always screw the numbers up, let's just say it was 13 states that no longer had class F fly ash volumes to mitigate uh, ASR and other physical and chemical concrete attack mechanisms. And by 2021, it was either 13 or 16, let's just say 16, that were being added to that list uh, that didn't have those fly ash volumes anymore. So by 2021, over half of the states on the continent of the United States will not have class F fly ash to mitigate those physical and chemical attack mechanisms, which blows my mind because we're going to keep constructing concrete anyway, creating a, a greater waste cycle for our children, our great grandchildren, and so on. It's these new and emerging technologies, the admixtures that we're using throughout this research through you and your team and our team 
uh, that are going to save the world with all the concrete in it. So how to use these? Um, I think I've got a video that does this. So go check it out on YouTube. Yeah. So go check it out. But There's they're, a link. they're uh, basically, what we start out with is a certain dosage rate. We apply that dosage rate to our 100 weight of cement, and we come out with a volume per cubic yard. So we're going to do that in this video. Check it out and let us know what questions you have, because we're really excited to show you how to do this on the back end of a truck for scalable applications to meet the demand of the industry. Um, so let's get into how to apply admixtures. There are different methods. With some admixtures, we're going to like our older uh, or our mid-range or normal range water reducers. Even our accelerators, we're going to put them on our head water as opposed to our tail water. When it comes to our newer technologies like our high range water reducers, our nano silicas or carbon nanotubes, we want to put it into the concrete mix when everything has already been put in there, when the, the light gray cement has been combined with water and water reducers and it's turned into dark gray and it has a fluidity to it, that's when we start adding our nanotechnologies and our newer technologies. Even our high range water reducers don't go in until either with or after the tail water. Now, uh, our air and training agent, they traditionally go on our sands and we normally want them to go on wet sand and then there are some also powders that can go in the cements or even on the aggregate as it goes up the belt into the back of the truck. It was an awesome day today. I, I, I was excited to do this lesson because it skims the surface. It allows me to introduce to you the much bigger overarching idea that we're going to go after which is introducing you, the junior engineer, the future of the Air Force Civil Engineering Program to these new and emerging technologies that have the capacity to answer a lot of our concrete problems and a lot of our problems with not only meeting the demand of the mission as well as meeting the demand of construction during mission essential activities. And you know, sometimes we need one or two more years out of a structure. Using technologies out like this, not only do we get those one or two more years, but we can even get one or two more decades. So thanks for joining me today. I'm excited to get to more information. Stay tuned. Go concrete! Beat asphalt.